Welcome back to my Motorsport Manager and Fire Fantasy 20 mod playthrough. We head into race 3 in Munich with our first real driver, Jonathan Aberdeen. His car will be equipped with the latest engine, gearbox, suspension and rear wing part upgrades. Before every race you're afforded short practice sessions. The practice sessions are the proverbial first step up to the race podium. Not only do the drivers need to relearn the tracks for the specific car, but the car itself must be adjusted for the track as well. These are represented in the game with knowledge and a setup score, respectively. Knowledge is gained by simply putting in laps around the track. They gain knowledge on the tire they are using, as well as whether they are practicing on a qualifying trim or racing trim. In FF20, F3 has no qualifiers, so the only choice for us is to practice on a race trim. The amount of knowledge gained is determined by your driver's feedback stat, which culminates up to three levels, for a given tire and trim. We'll cover how those knowledge levels are applied later, but know that the more you gain the better. As for the setup score, it is a culmination of how well the car is set up for the track given three car balance categories, downforce, handling and speed balance. Your driver tells you whether each category feels good or bad when they put in a lap. You affect those categories by adjusting aerodynamics, tire pressure, camber, gear ratios and suspension. Further, each setting affects two different car balance categories, essentially making the car setup a pseudo-puzzle you have to figure out every race. Your mechanics give you an educated guess as to how to set up the car, represented by a range for each setup category. This range shrinks the more laps your driver puts in, but only the driver can tell you how the setup actually feels. It's not clear exactly how much the setup affects a car's pace, but it does matter. However, there are diminishing returns. For example, a 100% perfect setup is possible, but the time spent to achieve that will not offset the knowledge that could have been gained otherwise. The longer you're in the pits tinkering with the car, the longer the driver is not out on track putting in practice, and vice versa. I try to aim for a score of at least 95%, then try to put in as many laps as possible. If there's a better way to do things, I'm all ears. As mentioned before, F3 has no qualifier, instead we go into the race with a completely random grid. Before the race, you can make last minute changes to the car's setup, change tires, or adjust the fuel load. We'll be underfueling and taking a conservative pace. You can also equip, up to two pieces of knowledge to use in the race, such as the ones gained during practice. Those pieces of knowledge give you a speed boost up to 15%, depending on the level of knowledge. The speed boost only applies when you're using the corresponding trim or tires. So in the case of a rainy race day, the choice between knowledge on slick tires or wet weather tires could be significant. Mechanics also give access to more advanced pieces of knowledge, which we'll cover once we unlock them. Unfortunately we were only able to gain level 1 race trim knowledge, for a total speed boost of 5%. If you haven't already, definitely save any good setups for the future. You will likely race on the track many times in the future and having a saved setup could save you some guesswork with the initial setup. During a race, instead of controlling the cars, you dictate how hard your drivers push their engine and how aggressive they drive. At the same time you have to make sure their tires don't overheat or get too cold, as well as keep an eye on park condition and maintain fuel levels. You also control the pit stops. This means changing the tires at an optimal time, making the correct tire choice, and, if necessary, repairing damage as soon as possible. It goes without saying, proper micromanagement of the race strategy is mandatory. The start of every race is always chaos because of the game's bumper car-like simulation model. This, coupled with our conservative strategy, meant that Aberdeen dropped several positions by turn 3. We aren't too concerned however, as our race strategy is different from the rest of the field's more aggressive start. Aberdeen drops down to P19 by turn 9, but it's a surprisingly clean first lap so far, considering the rain. It's best to not push your drivers too hard in the wet as they tend to lose control more often under these conditions. We approach the last few corners of the track and there is still plenty of action across the field, but Aberdeen holds his position.
Lap 2 starts with a ton of cars locking up on turn 3, causing multiple collisions. Aberdeen was caught in the scuffle, but thankfully sustained no damage. The dust settles and De La Vara, Ferrucci, Ortman and Leclerc are in desperate need of repairs. And despite all four drivers coming under investigation for the incident, the stewards only penalized Leclerc with a drive through penalty. One lap later, Schumacher makes contact with Florsch and takes damage. He will have to take a pit for repairs and is served a drive through penalty for his troubles. Not long after the start of lap 4, De Vries loses it on turn 2 and ends his own race. Meanwhile, Aberdeen climbs back up to P15 amidst the chaos. Further up the field, there was contact at turn 3 again and Delatraz was given the third drive through penalty of the race. Towards the end of lap 5, water levels are finally starting to drop and we call Aberdeen in for mediums. It's a bit of a gamble, but they should last him until the end of the race. Our pit crew matches the pace of the field, and Aberdeen only drops to P16. The second set of cars change their tyres and Aberdeen jumps up to P12. He's notably the only driver on the track not on soft tyres. Later in the race, on lap 14, Aberdeen held onto his position despite the harder tyre compound. He outlasted the tyres of the cars ahead, and jumped up to P9 while they dove into the pits. The race has been going perfect for us so far, but on lap 18 the rain started to come down again, this time with much more force. This completely destroys our initial one-stop strategy, however, there's another opportunity for a bold move. Based on the predicted water levels, intermediate tyres would only be good for about 2-3 to three laps. So I decide to gamble again by going directly onto wet tyres to avoid the additional pit stop. Aberdeen exits the pit and his pace is clearly hurting with these tyres and water levels. He's promptly eaten up by the cars that chose to switch to intermediates. Aberdeen drops to P12 by lap 22, but it's here that the water levels finally transition to favour wet tyres. Half the field is forced to pit for the change and Aberdeen jumps to P8. One lap later, the rest of the field came in for wets and Aberdeen jumped again to P6. Despite our initial strategy not going to plan, we successfully adapted to the changing conditions and gained positions without having to fight for overtakes. No other curveballs were thrown for the rest of the race, and Aberdeen's pace lasted until the chequered flag, finishing in P6. Despite running the relatively same strategy for the reserve driver, his pace was too slow for any strategy to make up for it and only finished P22. After each race, every car is checked by the FIA's scrutineers for any rule violations. The AI teams have the choice to run risky parts as well, and run a similar risk of being caught, which is what happened to two cars. One cheater was Braun GP Zylot, who finished in P2 and was demoted all the way down to P23. Tolman GP's De La Vara was also caught, but he only finished in P20 and was bumped to dead last. This means that Aberdeen was bumped to P5 and our reserve driver to P20. As for the rest of the race, Schwarzman takes P1 for Sauber and he jumps to P2 in the driver's championship. The breakout result of the race is March Engineering's driver, Zellers, who earns her first points of the season by finishing in P2. Finally, Penske's Ferrucci rounds out the podium. Cosworth severely underperformed and lost their lead in the constructors, thanks to Vesti finishing in P16 and Delatraz finishing in P17. Despite being outside of the points, Delatraz still holds onto P1 in the drivers' championship. After each race, we're given a report on how the results affect various aspects of the team. It's pretty self-explanatory. If the race went well, your drivers, mechanics and chairman are happy. Verstappen wins back-to-back -back GPs, launching Red Bull into P2 of the constructors over Ferrari. Yes! Boys, come on! Yes! Meanwhile, the podium is rounded out by Hamilton in P2 and Vettel in P3. We've scouted even more academy drivers, including Braun GP's Callum Eilot, but the best choice for our second driver is one we scouted earlier, Marta Garcia. So we send her an offer, and she accepts. 
Like most motorsport competitors today, Garcia cut her teeth in karting and won the CIK FIA Karting Academy Trophy and Trofeo del Industry in 2015. She went on to compete in SMP F4 and Spanish F4, and most recently finished fourth in the W Series 2019, an all-female F3 series, thanks in no small part to a win at the Norris Ring. Now that we have our primary drivers set, both of which have high marketability scores, this bumps our total marketability from two stars, up to four stars. This is a massive upgrade in terms of the money we can get with sponsors. So much so that it's worth racing with one less sponsor, in order to get better offers for that slot. Additionally, another benefit from our Flex N-Gate sponsor is that they've built us a helipad, which unlocks the option for five-star sponsors, if we can get our team marketability up. We've also finished development on our second gearbox, as well as a second suspension. We could build more parts, but we've reached the highest tier of components possible with our current HQ levels, so I'd rather save that money for future seasons. Even with our upgrades, our car is still considered one of the worst on the grid, but that's mostly offset by our finalized driver lineup. Another FIA rule change is proposed, this time it's to increase the average race length from 27 laps, up to 36. I abstain, but in hindsight I should have voted yes. I was working towards maximizing the durability of my current parts and I find that the AI has a tendency to drive their cars and drivers a bit harder, so this might have benefited me in the future. The rule change is ultimately declined. Oh well. There was quite a long time until our next race. There are also many more races that happen in F1, so they completed two before the start of one of ours. Vettel took P1 in Vancouver, followed by Bottas. Sainz made a breakout finish for McLaren and took P3, which shot him straight into the lead of the so-called F1.5 herd. This result also meant that Ferrari and Red Bull once again swapped places in the constructors, while Mercedes chill in P1. Meanwhile at Guildford, it's Leclerc who takes home the win for Ferrari, followed by Hamilton in P2 and Albon in P3. The championship standings stay largely the same, with Ferrari extending their lead over Red Bull. With our drivers secured and our cars upgraded, we head into our fourth race in Dubai with our team fully powered. I hope to see you guys next week, to see what our team can achieve.